People etc. by Elma Mitchell. Starting off first of all with the title. The word etc. etc. is an adverb used at the end of a list to indicate that further smaller items are included or indicating that a list is too tedious or cliched to give in full. Now if you take these definitions into account it gives quite a quite a um, element of boredom within the t within within the title we don't really feel that the speaker is that necessarily interested in the people and i can suggest here as i've said that there's many different types of people and there's too long a list to list in full but you could also analyze it to suggest that as i said an element of boredom suggesting that people are all the same and not important enough to list their different traits or personality types it really depends on how you want to analyze it but really put some thought into it that title and what it means to you and what it means for you and what it means uh, for the poem as a whole. Okay, so we'll start off uh, thinking about the five senses. It doesn't use all five. Think about why that might be. Okay, so we're going to stanza one. People are lovely to touch. A nice, warm, sloppy, tilting belly, happy in its hollow of pelvis like a bowl of porridge. Now, first of all, the word choice of People, there's no one person in particular here. Lovely, I mean, quite a warm word choice. It's going to take connotations of happiness and the implicit use of the word love. If you look at it, the word love is in lovely. So it's a very warm, nice kind of word choice. And the idea of touch, it's evoking one of the five senses uh, being touch. There's also an essential nature to that as well. The word choice of nice. Well, it's, um, and the rest of the stanza as well has a very childlike feel to it. It's not a very complex word, nice. It's not the most complicated, emotive word that could be used when describing people. Just like the idea of people, etc. It's a very, very general, non-emotive word. Uh, a nice, warm, slop, sloppy, tilting belly, happy in its hollow of pelvis. Happy in its hollow, use of alliteration could represent the sound of the person breathing as their belly goes up and down as they breathe. And notice here the enjambment is used here to emphasise the roundness of the person's stomach. There's no punctuation to, uh, to mess it up or to get in the way. It's really just trying to emphasise that idea of roundness uh, of the stomach and almost the perfection, the perfection of its roundness, just like human beings are. Uh, the idea of like a bowl of porridge as well, the simile comparing a humic stomach to resting in the small area of your pelvis being compared to a bowl of porridge, a little bit out there. And again, continues the warm, fulfilled mood which is present throughout the whole stanza, this nice, uh, reassuring, comforting, warm bowl of porridge which is talked about. This whole stanza is used to explain the happiness and beauty of the human body and they're using their sight to describe it, the obvious sense of sight to describe it. And it's really getting at the idea that people come in all shapes and sizes, people look different, uh, but it's almost the perfection almost of the human body which the speaker, the poet, is admiring. Get into stanza two. People are fun to notice, their eyes taking off like birds, away from their woods to settle on breasts and ankles, irrelevant as pigeons. Now again, notice we've got a punctuation dash there to create a pause and also to explain why they're fun to notice. And we've got enjambment being used there. So the idea of people are fun to notice. The use of sights uh, continue to being used. They're still using their eyes to look at it. Uh, to look at it, sorry. The simile here, their eyes taking off. So people are fun to notice, fun to look at. Their eyes taking off like birds away from their words. We've got a half rhyme there. The simile is used to compare the way that people lose focus at looking at the person they're talking to and quickly focus on someone else if they find them attractive or interesting or different. Just simply that idea that people, even when you're having a conversation, they might suddenly look away and look at somebody else. And the word choice of birds, birds being typically associated with love uh, and also freedom as well. The eyes taking off like birds away from their words and again, uh, Elma Mitchell's actually a Scot herself, so in the Scottish vernacular, that's a half rhyme that's being used, the, 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 the accent. Uh, birds and words 
even that in an English kind of accent, you get a half rhyme going there. But again, there's no constant rhyme throughout. There's no constant rhyme being used, therefore suggesting that um, although it's not a perfect poem with a perfect rhyme scheme, it still it can be beautiful, just like people and how different they are. So their eyes taking off like birds, away from their words, to settle on breasts and ankles, irrelevant as pigeons. So continuing the idea of people's eyes uh, being like birds, their eyes now stare upon breasts and ankles of other people. Uh, it's really this idea that the, just like birds take off and land somewhere, people's eyes are taking off and their sight is being caught upon people's breasts or ankles. Um, and it's really just saying then it goes on to tell us irrelevant as pigeons, sorry, irrelevant as pigeons, finishing with the bird imagery with another uh, simile by stating that in actual fact the people, the fact that the people are looking at uh, other people is completely irrelevant. Only looking at someone is not enough to make an actual connection with them. So even though people are suddenly looking away during a conversation to look at somebody else. This is irrelevant. Everybody else in this world is irrelevant because ultimately you don't get to know somebody just through the sense of sight. You don't get to understand their inner being. You only see the superficial outward appearance. An enjoyment being used again there. I'll let you figure out why that one is. I'm not going to do all the work for you. Okay, stanza three. People are delicious to taste, crisp and soft and tepid as new-made bread, tangy as, tang as blackberries, luscious as avocado, native as milk, acrid as truth. So again, we've got this word choice. People, anaphora being used as almost each stanza begins with the same word. The word choice of delicious is a very emotive, as opposed to things like porridge being described before, We've now, we're now being told that uh, people are delicious to taste. It's a very emotive, sensual, and to an extent an erotic, sexual word choice to use here. So people are delicious to taste, and again the sense, another of the five senses being used. Crisp and soft and tepid as new made bread. And notice the punctuation there. We've gone from having an enjoyment being used throughout uh, the first two stanzas to now having commas there and punctuation at the end, breaking it up. This stanza really has a lot of um, contrasting ideas. It's, it's quite paradoxical in its nature. The idea of being crisp and soft, well, that's an oxymoron. How can something be crisp and soft at the same time? And tepid. Tepid's not warm, it's not cold, it's right in the middle. Tepid things aren't usually the nicest tasting certainly. Crisp and soft and tepid as new made bread. Uh, again you can analyse new made bread and really think about the different ideas that can suggest. Tangy as blackberries, luscious as avocado. Look at the caesura being used there in between blackberries and luscious. Tangy as blackberries, as luscious as avocado. Imagine an avocado and the, the, the feeling of it on your tongue. Again, some people might really like it, some people might really hate it. This again really emphasises the nature and the differences and the diversity of people and their tastes and their interests. People, you can't just get along with somebody well. You won't just be close friends or lovers because you both like avocado. It's really showing the mixture and the paradox, uh, paradox nature of human relationships and human beings. So uh, people are delicious to taste, crisp and soft and tepid as new made bread, tangy as blackberries, luscious as avocado, uh, and the caesura there really uh, uh, emphasising these two contrasting ideas. Luscious as avocado, uh, two similes being used again um, in one line to emphasise different taste textures and preferences of different people. Uh, native as milk, acrid as truth. Really interesting fine, final couple of lines here. Uh, the idea of native is milk. Well, milk being white can represent purity. Uh, it's also natural and has associations with nourishment, especially for the young. If you think about childbirth, newborn babies are fed on their mother's breast milk. Again, animals feed a lot of animals feed on their mother's breast milk as well. It helps them get strong, builds up their immune system, and everything else like that. So it's as native as milk. Is, is, uh, milk is natural to all, but as acrid as truth. 
Now, the word choice of acrid is really interesting here. Acrid means really bitter tasting. And there's a suggestion here, the two similes on different lines suggest that taste can be pure and beautiful like milk, but can also be bitter and unpleasant like uh, the word choice of acrid and the idea of truth. Suggesting here that the truth is bitter and, uh, and uh, not nice, therefore is it better to lie? It's a very strange couple of lines that come out there on this final two lines of the stanza. And it's really showing that, again, it's emphasising how not everything is as it seems with human beings, given their outward appearances. Okay, stanza four. We then get our then to told. It's interesting to note here that, in my opinion, the poet is the speaker and the speaker is the poet. They are one and the same person. This isn't a poem. This isn't a poet that uses a speaker to tell the story or to convey ideas. This is a poet who is the speaker. It's the speaker's frustration at really being trying to be really being unable to focus in on the on the real complexities of the uh, and characteristics of an individual person. Sure, they can describe and discuss general people, we're all quite similar. Most uh, majority of us are able to obviously walk, talk, uh, smell, taste, you know, we've all got the same senses in common. It's very unusual that somebody has all five senses that they can't use. Therefore, we're all connected by this. And yet, there's a real frustration that the, the, the poet is unable to really see beyond just the outward appearances of human beings. It connects almost to this idea of no man is an island that obviously John Donne spoke about. We then saw in To Marguerite by Matthew, Matthew Arnold, we saw him actually declaring that we are islands, we are individual, we are separate. This idea of um, that Mitchell's trying to convey really builds in this idea that, you know, it's a combination, it's a halfway house between Dunn and between um, Arnold. It's really saying that, yeah, we're all connected by the fact that we have shared this, can share the same experiences and ideas, but what sets us apart is actually, inwardly, we're very, very different. So it's slating slightly more to Matthew Arnold's argument there. Uh, let's go in and see what she's got to say about it, though. So, people are irresistible to draw. People and their beauty inspire art, obviously. This is really the artist, the, speak, the poet, the speaker that's speaking here. Hand following hand, eye outstaring eye. Repetition of hand and eye emphasising the exact details of both the artist and the subject. Uh, the idea of hand following high, uh, hand and eye outstaring eye. It's really the connection. Again, it's the idea that okay, we both have hands in common, we're able to look at each other. But again, there are outward things. We're still not getting, the artist still isn't being, un, is still unable to really uh, connect with the subject, the person being drawn in our innermost beauty or um, innermost feelings. Uh, and again, use of enjambment here, we're back, sorry, uh, oh, sorry, I've written use of enjambment. There's no use of enjambment that I should read. There is no use of enjambment to emphasize a careful. It's really the writers use punctuation there, not enjambment. Please ignore that, not enjambment. The writers use punctuation here to really set, it's, it's really emphasize the idea of the exact nature of somebody being drawn. If you're drawing somebody, then you have to take precise, careful uh, steps in doing so to make it perfect. And that's what the punctuation is being used here for, to really emphasize those careful, deliberate steps of drawing somebody. But again, even though you can carefully draw their outward appearance, you can't really know them on the inside. Um, and it also suggests an appreciation of their beauty, how careful they're going through uh, each stroke. Each curve of experience and experience of self. The word choice of curve means the curves of the drawing, but it also links back to stanza one, talking about the belly. People's bodies aren't perfect, but are still beautiful. So it's mixing this idea of the curves of the drawing, but also every curve and experience of self. Uh, every curve could represent every scar, whether it be physical or uh, metaphorical and emotional. Um, every bit that's drawn of, the, of this person is an experience of self, but yet we still don't really know that person within. Uh, felt weight of flesh, tension of muscle, and all the geology of an elderly face. And again, there's lots of word choices there that you can go in and analyze and develop there. 
Uh, it could be analysed and interpreted as the act of having sex as well, the felt weight of flesh, the tension of muscle, uh, and then it goes on and tells us, and all the geology of an elderly face. And the word, word choice of geology, really, really wrinkly, lots of lines in their faces, again showing experience, showing a lived life, but we don't know the person within. But this all links in with the idea of experience that is mentioned above. We then jump into stanza five, the final stanza. The poet is consciously trying to write this poem and has observed everything around, them, around her and is now coming down to this final write. And people are easy to write about. So people seem easy, people seem understandable. We understand them perfectly by looking at them, we think, but actually we don't know their innermost feelings or ideas. It's a rhetorical question that she starts off with here. It's used to remind the reader that the poem is an inspiration, about the inspiration of people for art and writing. It's spoken about how easy people are to describe and draw, yet she's finding it difficult. The irony is that in her internal discussion with herself, she'd actually written about the people and done the poem. You can also interpret it as being an element of doubt or insecurity in the poet's own abilities. She feels she's unable to write about people. She certainly is unable to write about a single person, a single subject and their innermost feelings and emotions. And that's really underneath all that's the frustration that she's contending with in this poem. But And, and, and the inability to really almost recognise it and certainly to uh, accept it as a good poem really highlights her insecurities of her as the poet. And so she says, and people are easy to write about. Don't say it. What are these shadows vanishing round the corner? And she's used enjoyment here to create the effect of the shadows of people disappearing around the corners. Really cleverly done here. Single words on lines, word choice, very interesting. Uh, now, it is your task to analyse her different word choices, especially in this stanza, using denotation and connotation to help you to analyse the poem in more depth. Okay. So, some final words, talking about or some final ideas about structure, tone analysis and so on. Anaphora is used throughout the poem to emphasise the central theme of people. Almost every line begins with the word people, really emphasising it's people that are being spoken about, but not a specific person. Almost all the senses are used apart from smell and sound. It's a, therefore a suggestion that without all five senses being used, it's difficult to entirely to get to know people fully or to entirely fall in love with them. Likewise, the structure has no definite rhyme scheme or set form. It's not iambic pentameter or anything like that. There's no set rhyme scheme, although there are half rhymes throughout it, perhaps suggesting that people can get close to perfection like a perfect poem, but actually nobody's perfect, and that is what makes people unique and beautiful in their own ways. However, it is imperative upon us as fellow human beings to engage with that spiritual, spiritual idea and connect with it and get to know the person beneath the exterior image of, of the body. Uh, and the use of structure, or, or, the, or the little use of structure, I should perhaps say, really emphasises this idea as well. The tone is that of contentment. It's quite a, a it's happy with people. It, it digs people. It thinks they're cool. It likes them. It likes the way they look. The way the way that we have things in common. It, it's fine with that. However, there's also frustration. Yes, the speaker's content with the diversity and beauty of people, but there's also a sense of frustration that really prevails beneath it, that everyone is so diverse and therefore she finds it difficult to really focus in and write about and develop her thoughts and ideas on that one person. And the poem is essentially saying that we spend so much time focusing on the outward appearances of people and think that we know them as we're able to observe them. However, they're not good sentences, I do apologise. However, as a writer displayed through the speaker, who is the same person, trying to go deeper than outward appearances and understand a, a person is so much more complex. And as I've said before, we may well all have similar interests or habits, experience the same flavours and sights, uh, and are explicitly interested in other human beings. However, beneath the surface, we are all so different. And that's the real frustration that is bubbling beneath this poem, People Etc. by Elma Mitchell. Make sure that you go through it. Remember, my analysis is merely a starting point. I should have given you some ideas here, 
for you to play with, but it's really down to you to be de developing them in, in, your, in depth with your own ideas, own word choices and so on to be getting your A's and your B's. Uh, and that goes for everything, obviously, Jekyll and Hyde and so on. Really make sure that you take time, an hour or two hours, going through this poem, analysing it, understanding it, really getting to grips with it. Remember, you're not necessarily going to have it in the exam, therefore make sure that you know it and you have important word choices, important quotes, all memorised.